Our next speaker is Michel Fouché. Uh, I had an honor to meet him about 10 years ago when he was the ambassador to Riga, wasn't he? And of course, uh, str strategic cooperation between Russia and France always was uh, something to reckon with in the geopolitics of the world. So your view on what's happening with Russia would be very interesting for us. Yes, Mr. President, in Russia and around Russia. So I, I have accepted to uh, the challenge of uh, projecting ourselves in 2037. Uh, this is an interesting exercise for uh, a former director of the policy planning staff of the French Foreign Ministry. I have been working five years with Hubert Vedrin. But I know by experience, and, and you will see that later on, that it's a very risky exercise. Even if, you know, looking long term, we have to look at long term issue both sides. And to keep in mind fundamental and structural elements in the long life of any state, history and geography matters. And because it's uh, informed about the interplay between internal and in international context. So I will start with the international context. Uh, no scoop in my speech. But uh, as far as I know, the only country where high level political leaders are projecting in the long term in open speeches is China. It's, uh, it's interesting. They have a long-term plan until the uh, anniversary of the Republic in 2049. And in 2049, the objective is to be the first world power and to have a world-class army. This was expressed by President Xi some days after the big as a big play. In between 2020, 25, what they call average affluence, which is a realistic view of uh, level of life, but also outdoor projection. Uh, last year, I was asked by Thierry de Montréal to be part of the workshop on China, and I made a presentation on one belt, one rule strategy, Idu, Eli. What I uh, uh, look in the new um, um, uh, landscape of um, the new, partly new, permanent office of the Central Committee of the Communist Party is that five, uh, four of the seven members, old and new, were already active in Idai Ilyu project and especially Wang Yang, and the other one, Mr. Hu, who is the intellectual of the international department of the party. He invented the concept of Chinese. What does it mean? It means that uh, the time of restraint in foreign policy is definitely over, not only because of Donald Trump. And we have to take that into uh, consideration. So the Chinese factor will be decisive uh, in the overall pro positioning of Russia in 2037, but also for other countries in Eurasia and in Indo-Pacific as well. This is a real game changer. Chinese challenge is even more pressing for the United States which are confronted with a kind of contradictory situation where the first economic partner, and a recent book was published by an American diplomat with the title of Chinese, uh, China, US, Codependence, La Codependence. <coughs> the first economic partner is at the same time the first strategic rival. This is absolutely new in, in, in the world stage, at least so far in Eastern Asia. So there is a Chinese affirmation, which is also a challenge for the European Union. 
because view from Beijing, the European Union is both a huge market and a target because of its advanced technological industry. It's a target. And we are working now on uh, a system of control, collective control, of uh, investment, foreign investment in strategic industrial assets. It's a matter of sovereignty. The problem is that the European Union is not a state, so it's difficult to talk about sovereignty at level. A French former prime minister told me recently that a high-ranking member of the international department of the Chinese Communist Party had this formula in private. Who controls Europe controls the world. It's a kind of Mackinder style affirmation. As, uh, if you look at the strategic uh, literature in Beijing, you will see that Mackinder is once again uh, but, uh, on the front page, an article, it's about Eurasia. I'm not sure it's good news. China rise, and I will stop with China, is based on a very solid ground, economy. And now more and more technology. Like Europe, like the US, a bit less in Russia. Russia is lagging behind. Uh, it's not my role to talk about internal situation, but from 1955 to 1985, USSR and China had exactly the same GDP. In 2037, according to OECD forecast, uh, Donald, the gap will be between China and Russia in PPA uh, six to one, six to one. At one point, uh, an economic power is tempted to transform its economic and financial capacity into more classical geopolitical power. Second factor is the US. This was addressed, I, I will not insist on that, but in 2037, I expect US feeling less as a European power. For many reasons, not only the Chinese challenge, it's also, or, or this was uh, mentioned this morning by, by Hubert Vedrin. What has started with the end of Obama and with Trump, it's, in my view, a deep trend. American people, except maybe in the East and the West Coast, doesn't want any more to pay the heavy cost of being the guardian, the gendarme, the constable of the world order. The sheriff put his star down on the table. This is a long trend. It's beyond Chinese factor. And my view is also in the long term divergences between Brussels and Washington have grown on many issues, fiscal issues, extraterritoriality of American law, and the EU, I hope so, has grown, we are always in fiction, eh, Mr. President, geopolitical fiction, more autonomous under the leadership of Paris and Berlin to face global challenges, because my view of the European process is that uh, we, we have to adapt today at a new scale of realities. The previous uh, scales were, you know, reconciliation between France and Germany in the context of the Cold War. After that, for France, decolonization. After that, change in Central, Eastern Europe and USSR. And now there is a new challenge for the European project itself. What is his meaning? in the global context, which is new for us. We are not ready today to address that. So the positive outcome of that new landscape in 20 years' time, a common Chinese challenge and an evolution of the transatlantic relation could be 
a better understanding between EU and Russia because we have shared interest in the long term. I say Europe, not the West. It's the exit of the Cold War was failed. Let's find something else. And with the new international context, we have a very narrow margin of error. Let me take a stupid risk. 2037 will mark the beginning of a fourth presidential mandate in Russia since 2018. President Sergei Shoigu will have found his successor after two terms. Of course, the regime of visit ban to the EU, which is affecting your Minister of Defense today, will have been cancelled before the election. We cannot accept a diplomatic scene with a new elected president cannot travel to, to Brussels, Berlin. So, which are the Russian interests in 20 years' time? In 2037, Russian population is more or less 1.7 of the world population. Large territory, the same one, 13% of the land surface, I'm not referring to territorial waters. Russia remains underpopulated, few density, it's a fact. It means that, like in France, it's not so populated, France, it means that collective equipment have a cost, even if they are expensive. Even if digital technology could provide services to remote region in Russia. Russian power, two uh, in 30 years' time, is strong in military, geopolitical, and diplomatic terms. One example I study recently, uh, the Escadra, the Navy, is active in the Black Sea. You will have more than 30 warships if the program is completed, submarines, frigates, patrol boats, corvettes, included joint exercise with the Chinese Navy. Thank you for Moscow to allow Chinese Navy to go to former French-British Sea, Mare Nostrum. You will be active in the Arctic, less active in Western Pacific, but improve because in 20 years' time, you have time to sign up a treaty of peace with Japan, which is an obstacle to a real Asia-Pacific policy of Russia, and we will need that. Russia is very active in sec UN Security Council because you are, like the French, very multilateralist, and you will benefit for success from successes in mediation, especially in the Middle East in the 20s. I hope be not later. So you will be on the global stage with diplomatic capacities to mediate. Nobody else is able to do that today. It's fascinating. Minister Shoigu is traveling to Israel. The King Salman is traveling to Moscow, and some weeks after, President Putin is in Iran. Nobody is able to do that today, even the French. The asset of energy is real. I don't, want, I don't know your report, as long as oil is a key for transport. But in the next 20 years, things will change slowly if we listen to Patrick Pouyanné, but I give you just one example. The mayor of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, has decided that in 2030, there will be no car anymore in central Paris, in, 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 in Paris. Okay. So, a change. So, the real issue for Russia is the state of its economy at the global age. Today, its economy is not diversified enough, even if it is changing, to take benefit, full benefit from globalization. I quote a remark made by the Russian International Affairs Council in June 2017. The underdevelopment of the Russian economy and its governance institution poses a much more significant threat to the country's sovereignty and territorial integrity than realistic military threats that Russia is already well protected from. 
it is impossible to overcome this underdevelopment in isolation from the increasingly globalization outside world, quote unquote. So I'd like to, to prove it with a single example I got from uh, a dinner yesterday night. I was with the president of CNES. Uh, I remember that we had cooperation between France and Russia to launch Soyuz rockets in Kourou, Guyana. This is no more the case. The decision not to use our facilities, and by the way, technological cooperation, was taken before sanctions, before. It was a strategy. Uh, maybe uh, you will have Russian rockets in Guyana in 2013. At the same time, we have huge, uh, interesting capacities on science, technology, research, on climate issue between European and Russian, uh, Arctic Ocean. So we have a capacity to have first-class cooperation on common issues. So why Russia is not able among the BRICS to take benefit from globalization? I think it's basically the structure of the economy, inheritance, policies. It's a structural internal problem. But you know, the solution is not only with old-fashioned zero-sum gain geopolitics. It's not helpful. And the interaction, the economic interaction between Russia, China, and India due to Western sanction is very weak. So in my view, the EU should play and may play and should play a role in the modernization of Russia in the new global context because we have common interest. It's not new. After, in the past, in the 19th century, we had a huge flow of investment for France, from Germany, from England, to Russia. This was stopped by October Revolution one century ago. After that, flows was, were stopped, partly stopped by, by sanction and all this stuff. But why working with Russia to, to fill the gap between its strong external power and its deficient inclusion into the global stage? First and foremost, because it's our interest. Our interest. So it's a huge market next door. Companies are already working in Far East development because there is a new spirit in entrepreneurship. If we conclude we can be optimist, optimistic. Border quarrels between EU and Russia will all be solved. Ukraine will be a neutral country like Finland with success. Remember Václav Havel remarks, Russia does not know exactly where it starts and where it ends. The day where we will decide quietly, quietly, where the EU end and where the Russia Federation start, half of the tension between them will disappear. So if we can get out of the classical old-fashioned geopolitics and territorial glacis, we will make progress. OEC will resume importance. We will have a more relaxed NATO-Russia Council with a mission to sketch a new framework of security for the continent, a part of Eurasia. Let's come back to Avia meeting, 2008. I was there, President Medvedev, President Sarkozy. Looking back, the issue of the role and the place of Russia in the European concert, the Concert Européen, it's a very old story. We have to come back to that. We have to come back to that, it's a huge, Task. You mentioned, Mr. President, the four spaces of St. Petersburg. I wrote it before knowing that. If we don't do that, if we don't do that, if we don't set up a new European order in the next two decades, a new European concert, we will remain weak in the international sphere. We are not able to master a critical neighborhood and we will have a very bleak uh, future. So my, um, my view is that we, we should resume talks, at least at uh, track two level.
Yes, we can. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, bipolarity with which we started <clears throat> works for you internationally. Your analysis of the role of China and our role together with China and the role of the United States fits into this uh, trajectory of bipolarity. But internal bipolarity of Russia, you decided in favor of Shoigu, which is a little bit depressing for some of us. But you decided we will follow. Uh, <laughs> <I took the> <laughs> we will try to follow. Thank you.